Hello everybody, Dr. Alex Vasquez here with antiviral nutrition update number two for 2018. Again, these updates are based upon the foundational information and sources that I discussed previously, namely the books, articles, video presentations, and blogs. You have those listed for you again here. Again, the book Antiviral Strategies and Immune Nutrition was published as an ebook under the title of Antiviral Nutrition. I also have two journal articles here for you, also a conference presentation and a series of video tutorials that help to support this information. As I mentioned before, one of our goals is to have a structured understanding of viral infections and from that structured understanding to arrive at a comprehensive antiviral strategy. In other words, if you can't deconstruct the pathophysiologic event, in this case we're talking about viral infections, then you're pretty much trapped in the phenomena of viral infections. Achievement of goals is affected by strategies, and each strategy is affected by its tactics. And what that looks like visually is we have goals, in this case the prevention and treatment of viral infections. Supporting that goal is the strategy of addressing each one of the major components of a viral infection. So we want to deconstruct and address each major aspect of what we call viral infections generally. And to support that strategy, we're going to use a specific tactic, and that is the use of these clinical protocols for each component of the above mentioned strategy. Graphically, that's represented by these two images from my book. Again, antiviral strategies, also antiviral nutrition. We want to address the viral component. We want to address the replication of that virus. We want to address immunonutrition, and we want to support cellular and systemic health as well. In antiviral nutrition update number one for 2018, we looked at this article, Effects of Long-Term Vitamin D Supplementation on Regression and Metabolic Status of Cervical Intraepithelial Neoplasia. You've got all of the information summarized for you here, so I won't go through it in its entirety, but you're certainly welcome to pause the video and read the screen if you want to get the information from our previous conversation. Likewise, I also reviewed the biological effects of vitamin D3 supplementation and optimization, mostly specific to the treatment of viral infections. And then I provided some clinical context and conclusions. Again, you're welcome to pause the video and review that previous information. One of the preventive measures for HPV viral infection related illness is the anti-HPV vaccination. I consider that vaccination to be expensive and the data has shown quite conclusively that this vaccination can produce many biologically proven adverse effects, including autoimmunity, neuroinflammation, infertility, and death. And it really doesn't provide any collateral benefits and I'll touch more on that topic throughout this presentation and especially at the end. So when we actually look at the data, we do see some concerns about the human papillomavirus vaccine. You can see that this was published by the American College of Pediatricians in January of 2016, citing some concern about premature ovarian failure, premature menopause. These are legitimate concerns related to the aluminum adjuvant, which has been shown to cause ovarian toxicity and especially when combined with another vaccine component, polysorbate 80. In the human clinical literature, we see documentation of serious adverse events after HPV vaccination. This was a critical review of randomized trials and post-marketing case series. Another one from Immunology Research 2017, severe somatoform and dysautonomic syndromes after HPV vaccination. This was a case series and review of the literature. And here also we see immunological studies showing abnormalities in cerebrospinal fluid from patients with CNS symptoms after HPV vaccination. So in our last conversation, we talked about vitamin D. We looked at some of the information showing that it can actually promote regression of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade one. And that's been shown in an oral study using approximately 3,500 international units per day of vitamin D3. This was also shown in a topical study using vaginally applied vitamin D. And you can see that described here in a publication from Dermatoendocrinology in 2014. So we're going to maintain this theme, talking about nutrition against HPV infection and its consequences. Today for Antiviral Nutrition Update 2018, number two, 
we're going to look at this article from the British Journal of Nutrition 2015, The Favorable Effects of Long-Term Selenium Supplementation on Regression of Cervical Tissues and Metabolic Profiles of Patients with Cervical Intraepithelial Neoplasia. This, like the other one, is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. You've got the citation and you also have the digital object identifier in the upper right-hand corner. You can pause the video if you want to read the abstract, otherwise I will provide you my summary here. So again, the title of this article, Favorable Effects of Long-Term Selenium Supplementation with Regard to Cervical Intraepithelial Neoplasia Caused by HPV Viral Infection. Again, British Journal of Nutrition, December of 2015. This is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial with approximately 50 women with cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade one. The intervention here was 200 micrograms of selenium for six months. The results showed that after six months of taking selenium supplements, a greater percentage of women in the selenium group had regressed their CIN1, that was 88% versus 56% in the placebo group. They also noted significant decreases in fasting plasma glucose levels, reduced insulin levels, improved insulin sensitivity, reduced triglycerides, and elevated HDL. That suggests greatly improved metabolic efficiency in terms of using glucose and insulin sensitivity versus insulin resistance. Number four, they showed improved antioxidant defenses with elevated glutathione and a reduction in oxidative stress markers. And as we would expect, they showed excellent safety again from 200 micrograms of selenium for six months. Let's look at some of the antiviral mechanisms of selenium. Number one, selenium reduces viral mutation. So when we look at the antiviral strategy that I've outlined, we see that selenium has antiviral effects by blocking viral mutations. Oxidant-driven mutagenesis promotes viral immune escape and selenium clearly retards this process. So that might be one of the mechanisms of benefit here from selenium supplementation in the treatment of HPV-related disease. Number two, we also know that selenium inhibits the NF-kappa B pathway to retard viral replication. Viruses famously hijack this NF-kappa B pathway to promote their own replication. So again, selenium helps with a direct antiviral effect and it also blocks viral replication. Number three, Selenium provides some antioxidant benefits via glutathione peroxidase specifically, thereby obviously working in tandem with riboflavin, which is the cofactor for glutathione reductase. Selenium helps to prevent premature immunosenescence due to activation and oxidation. Number four, selenium promotes lymphatic flow. This has been demonstrated in studies showing that selenium is effective in the treatment of post-nodectomy lymphedema. Selenium also supports thyroid function and again, it is a general antioxidant. So I think we could reasonably say that selenium provides cellular and systemic support in addition to its other benefits in combating viral infections and supporting immune health. So now let's contextualize this within the overall strategy, the antiviral nutrition strategy. Our goal with this strategy is the safe and effective prevention and treatment of viral infections and diseases that are secondary to those viral infections. Our aspirational goal, beyond that rather narrow primary goal, is the ideal, which is that our treatments should be safe, they should have no side effects, they should be effective, they should be widely available and affordable, they should have minimal or no drug interactions, and we'd love some collateral benefits. Furthermore, we also want to respect patient autonomy and human rights. This was previously known as medical ethics before the era of mandatory medicalization. Our strategy to support those goals is to deconstruct the phenomena of what we think of when we talk about viral infections into its main components, and our tactic is to effectively address each component with an effective and safe clinical protocol. Thus far in this conversation for 2018, we've discussed vitamin D3, and here I've discussed selenium. So thank you very much for attending this very brief video update and I will provide some more information, of course, as this series progresses. Again, here you've got the previously mentioned kind of foundational information upon which we're providing these updates, specifically antiviral strategies and also antiviral nutrition. That was also published in my 2016 book, Inflammation Mastery, and also in a smaller volume, the two-volume set, published under the title Textbook of Clinical Nutrition and Functional Medicine. In this case, it was in Chapter 4, 
So that's volume one. So thank you again for your attention during this very brief and efficient video update, and I look forward to sharing more information with you soon.